what is up everybody good evening welcome to episode 26 of the agree to disagree show podcast where we discuss current events politics and pop culture as i remind you every week guys we are currently streaming live on facebook and youtube and this will also be available in a podcast format um wherever you get your podcasts including spotify and apple podcast people i um I, I also would like to tell you please guys put in your comments say hi i'm already i already see our comments here who says ah jofo podcast massimo here we go guys tonight we have a treat for you uh my guest is massimo canestraro is a comedian actor from montreal uh, and he's currently hiding out in florida and i'm gonna ask him about that so uh without further ado let me bring him on to the show he's in you're currently so excited waiting in the background and he's having a drink massimo hey man how are you i'm very good that was uh fuck man best intro uh, ever so much uh excitement and energy <laughs> in that uh intro <laughs> you do, are, you being, uh, are you being facetious or, or what uh i don't know what the fuck you just called me bro but i was being sarcastic yes absolutely <laughs> 100 you know what since i started this podcast no, i'm just I'm kidding to... man uh it was a great intro i'm being serious yeah yeah i'm, I'm yeah, trying yeah, to yeah. find i'm trying to find new words since i started this podcast first of all let me say <laughs> words words are hard, you know words are hard. i know you love those right mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> no it's i have trouble you know i i chose public speaking <laughs> as a profession but i do have trouble uh i have trouble speaking i sometimes mispronounce <laughs> words you know Sometimes well, I use words, on. I don't even know what the fuck they mean. I know but what facetious means, though. You know what I mean? It means you're the, being a dick. Yeah. <laughs> no. But here's the difference, though. You became an actor, which basically all you got to do is read, write a script. <laughs> if only I knew how to read, bro. <laughs> uh, I improv all my lines in movies. You I'm do? Kidding. No, I do it. No. Good thought, come, man. Be, I would never work if that was the case. No, yeah, no. I, 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 know, I know how to read, you know? I can look at things. Let, I can look at letters, put them together. Grade level five, six. No. Yeah, I probably, yeah. I, I probably, no joke. Uh, I probably have a, a grade ten reading level, which I guess is not that bad, but also not amazing. <laughs> no, not, not, not amazing. First of all, Mass, I, I want to say thank you so much. I've been, I've been wanting to have you on the show for so long, and I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, uh, when I when I do my announcements, uh, and I uh, you know every every week I do the, the the publicity for the show and for the podcast, and the most the, the biggest one of the biggest responses I got was for your show. Oh man! Uh, that's, uh, and then the other shows they're like, "My bro, gives a fuck." <laughs> Are we allowed to, you do you uh, if you don't you, like people swearing on your show, maybe I could stop swearing, bro. No, no, you could swear. You could okay. swear. In, in no, English. I just know some people. You know, they prefer less swearing and whatever. You know. No, uh, I don't have to swear. Uh, you could swear in English, French, Sicilian, uh, whatever else language you want. It's it's all good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for, for so first of all, what I wanted to wanted to, want to ask you is, how, are you hiding out? What are you hiding out from in Florida? What's going on? How did this hiding out, bro? I don't know what to call it. hiding out. Uh, what, what you know, did you I do? Got, I got you... married. I can't go out anymore. That's all I know. <laughs> uh, you... No, I got. Uh, I started dating. Uh, uh, you know, my beautiful wife. Um, okay. In uh, what, what was it? Like mid, I guess mid 2018. I think we right. met in um, 2018. We, you know, uh, she, um, you know. She, like, because I, you know, sometimes I used to put like, you know, comedy videos on yeah. like these, um, uh, what you call it, the, you know, Facebook, you know, American Italian, yeah, you know, uh, Facebook pages, you know, so whatever videos I would do, like sketches that had something Italian, you know, I would put it on these, I would share it to those pages. Anyway, long story short, she was also like a member of some of these pages that she followed mm -hmm. them as well. Anyway, she saw some of my videos, and then, uh, you know, it kind of it was kind of those things, you know. It happened like I was planning to go to New York um, okay. with one of my friends who lived there, and I was going to stay with him and just check out, you know, because I already had plans to move uh, to New York to the U.S. Okay, and I go, let me go, you know, I go, I'll go in May for a month, you mm -hmm. know, check out the scene, see how it is, see if I would like to live there. I already knew that I would, you know, like to live in New York. Anyway, long story short, she contacted me and she was, you know, we we're we we're talking online, and then she was like, you know, I. Um, you know, I'm from Florida, but I live in New York right now. You know, if you're ever in New York, 
you know, look me up kind of thing. You know, maybe we should get together. And I was like, yeah, you know, we should get together mm. for Dre. I go, actually, I'm coming in May, you know, for a month. Um, I go, maybe we can get together. Anyway, long story short, you know, we started seeing each other, sure. dating. And uh, now I'm married, bro. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So, basically, yeah, I'm not hiding out, you know. I just, uh, but, <laughs> I but we were living uh, in, you know, she was living in New York. Uh, okay. When I met her, it was already three years that she was living there. And uh, she's a uh, nurse practitioner. And she wants to um, continue her education. Okay. Um, she wants to get a certification. And it's like a lot easier for her to do it uh, here in Florida. So uh, because in New York, it's more of a New York State thing as yeah. far as the program she wants to do. In New York, it's like you have to do to do the program. It's like twice as long okay. um, and all that. So it's a lot more time. Whereas here, like I think there it's like two or three years. Whereas here in Florida... She can get it done in like you know twelve months, so it's like you know at least half of the time wow. to do it. So we're just here temporarily, okay. And then um, probably in about a year, you know, once is pretty much you know once once she finishes mm -hmm. uh, school, we're gonna head back to New York. Uh, right now, I'm in uh, Clearwater, Florida, which is Clearwater. Uh, yeah, which is the Scientology capital of the world. <laughs> I yes, I was just gonna. Yeah, say yeah. That. I always thought it was. Um, because I always thought it was like, you know, like Los Angeles, because there's the, you know, the Scientology, like the yeah. Celebrity Center, which is, you know, also pretty huge. But yeah. I always thought it was there. But it's apparently here in Clearwater. And does my hair look fucked up, bro? Your you know, hair was, looks, you look ravishing. I was, li I was lying down on the couch for at least four hours. <laughs> and I think it did great, great things for my hair. But uh, anyway, one day I was driving. This is when I first got here. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, like I said, my wife's from here. Well, actually, no. You know what? This was uh, Thanksgiving, not the one that passed now, but the Thanksgiving, uh, 2018, right? Okay. American Thanksgiving, which was yes. around November. So anyway, we were driving, and then she goes, "Look at that place." And I look, and I turn, and it's this giant palace. Like it looks like I'm not even exaggerating. A temple, uh, like a like as big like Buckingham Palace, yeah. something big like that. And I looked at it, and I immediately thought, "Oh, it must be some crazy like five star." mental you know hotel and she's like oh that's the scientology headquarters and it's this giant palace bro it's so big not only it's so big that it's it stretches the entire uh, width of a city block Jeez. but it's so big that that wasn't enough the block the city block that they built like you know like sometimes there's those buildings that there's like a like a tunnel like a tunnel that, like that, a... that joins them together like the twin yes. towers you know like yeah i know it's weird when you say like the twin towers because I don't know if they connect anymore, but buildings have that little, you know, connection part. Yes. Uh, so they have that big giant palace, and <laughs> which is the whole fucking city block, and then there's like a tunnel to connect over the street, and it keeps on going. Like it's just huge, huge, huge. That, 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 um, I, have you have you have you watched or heard any of those interviews? Like I recently watched, uh, listened to, and watched the the uh, Leah Remini when she was on yeah, Joe Rogan. Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw, I saw, I saw a couple of clips from that. I didn't watch okay. the whole episode. I, I watched the whole episode, man. Let me tell you, there's some, some, some serious fuckery going on around there, man. Oh yeah, you know, like I, yeah, uh, sometimes you go down those, you know, the rabbit hole, the YouTube rabbit hole. Yeah. And I think you know, I was just you know, because I'm you know a curious person, so sometimes I just want to you know, I wanted to, I don't know if I wanted to know something about Scientology or maybe I was looking for like a scene. You know, from Top Gun or something like that, and then there's all these other things that lead to that. But I started watching, and then I ended up watching this documentary on YouTube, which is this guy. He's not like a famous person or anything, but it's this documentary this guy made. He was he moved from wherever he was from. I think he was from the Midwest or whatever. But it's this dude. He moved to L.A. to become an actor and all that, and then he he was waiting in line one day. I think he was waiting in line to sign up to be like you know, like an extra, like a background actor, mm -hmm. you know, in a movie or whatever it was. But he was waiting in line for something that had to do with acting. And he's waiting in line. And because they know there's a lot of people waiting in line for these things, because it's, you know, it's LA. That's where all the studios are. Yeah. Sometimes you just, I don't know if they still do this, but I definitely know that back in the day they would. You would just kind of wait and see if they need extras or whatever it is. But anyway, I'm kind of rambling now. But <laughs> he was waiting in line and they know that people go there and wait in line for these things. So there's people offering these, like, uh, like, uh, like I don't know if it was like an acting workshop or it was like a workshop how to network and get into showbiz kind of thing. Okay. 
So they were handing out these things, and I don't know if it was free or if it was like a very small cost to take the class. So this guy's like, well, you know, and I saw the class, you know, and I figured, well, you know, uh, I'm trying what to break heck? into the scene as an actor. I'll go check it out. And then he goes there, but it's actually a Scientology thing. <laughs> and then there's like an actor who's like, you know, done a bunch of things. And on the flyer it says, you know, so-and-so who has been on this show and that show and whatever. And um, so that guy talks for like two minutes about acting. And then he like yeah. walks away and then somebody comes in. And then he just figured, well, probably, you know, it's good to network to get into the Scientology goes, you know, because I was aware. See, yeah, because they yeah, control yeah. a lot. And then, yeah. and then he just talks about his whole, then finally when he broke away, but like his whole like experience basically is just always giving money. Because once yeah. you get into Scientology, you've got to take this class to like heal, to see straight or whatever. And that's 300. Then you take that class, but you're almost done that class. You're like, and you keep on taking them. He was saying like, because, you know, you feel pressured to take them because you just want to be on good standings with, yeah. you know, um, everybody. But and then you're like, okay, I'll just take it, whatever, you know, uh, you know, that thing I wanted to do, I'll just do it fucking next month. And then once you're almost done with that class, then they come at you with another one. With you know another I mean? one. So many, yeah. So, so, so let me ask you, I'm not, you know, judging anybody who wants to be part of Scientology. I'm oh, just saying it costs a lot of money to be in Scientology. Oh, well, the, the things just that dro I dropping just a, a dollar or two. No, Side, no, you know that little basket for like no the church, far, <laughs> yeah, yeah, far, far from it. From from what yeah. the, Leah Rimini has to say, but let me let's let's put it this way. I have a question for you. If if since you you since you're a big Hollywood star, if Tom Cruise would call you one bro. day, yeah, if Tom Cruise would call you one day and say, yeah. Massimo. First of all, he he wouldn't be able to pronounce your last name, Massimo. Um, would you like to be part of the science, the Church of Scientology? What would you say? What would you well, answer? What I, if, if Tom Cruise would call you. I, I'm going to have, I already have enough with uh, being a Catholic. I don't need any more. No, I wouldn't. I don't think he, well, he would never really, I know you're speaking hypothetically. No, hypothetically, I, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I know, I know that. But, you know, that would never happen. You know what I mean? And it's a dumb question is all I'm saying, bro. Um, it's never going to happen. What's the fucking point of answering that question? Like, I was clearly, joking. if you're saying you want to join Scientology, first I'm going to go, bro, who is this? You sound nothing like Tom like Cruise. Like Tom Cruise. <laughs> Who is this? What is this? Johnny. Is it Johnny for fucking sake? But bro, I know it's you, bro. It's clearly a crank call. Um, but yeah, if I was asked, do you want to join? I would say uh, no, bro. My, my mom's going to give me a beating if I join Scientology. Could, could, um, yeah, no, no. We First of all, you, first of all here's the, the, be, the best sorry, bothers. It's not Sorry to cut you off. I already no, bothers okay. me when I ever have to go to church. Not that I go to church every Sunday. But whenever I go to church... You know, for like a wedding or a baptism, whatever. It bothers me already that I have to put like, you know, five bucks, right? Which is good. I, that's what I like about being in the, the States because they still have like $1 bills, right? Yes. So you yes. can fold a $1 bill and you put it in and people just see like a, a paper money. Yeah. Whereas in Montreal, you have to put like minimum $5 because then people just see you put a loon in and they go like, you know, like that's a shit. That's what you give in to God, right? <laughs> At least here you fold like a one and you throw it in. Nobody knows anything, <laughs> you right? Bastard. But it bothers me to put that because I'm like, but this, like this $5 I'm putting in the basket is going towards buying like a new, like a uh, castle for a cardinal to chill out on the beach. You know what I mean? <laughs> like uh, these, like all these cardinals, the bishops, all of them, they're all living in these fucking beautiful houses. I remember... My friend back in the day, this was when I was in elementary school, like whatever, I was 12, and he had a birthday party. And his parents had you know, a little bit of cash, you know? And they lived in a very nice home, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And Duvernay, there's like an area in Duvernay where it's all, you know, uh, you know, these like million dollar plus houses, yeah. probably even close to two million or whatever. But it's these nice big houses, like, you know, this is like 1988 or whatever. You know, yeah. that house was probably worth, you know, let's say 800,000, which was, you know, a lot of money for a house in Laval, you know, back in those days. But that house, before his parents bought it, that house belonged to a bishop. And this house was like fucking huge, bro. It had like, you know, four, five, six bedrooms. Do you know what I mean? Uh, in the uh -huh. basement. I remember, you know, he gave us a little tour. When we were in the basement. There was like a sauna, you know? This was a bishop. <laughs> a bishop. A bishop, you know? And yeah. I know that's higher up, but still, even though he's higher up, for me, like, if you're a priest, a bishop, whatever, like, you know, there's a church that you belong to. Like, I know you have to give them a place to sleep and they have to eat. But for me, it's like, 
you know, you, you have, let's say you have a church, then there should be a house behind that church and that's where you live. And there should be like, you know, diff, you know, people living together. Not that you give a million dollar house for one bishop, you know, uh, and meanwhile we're giving money and the church is saying it goes to help the church and also to help the needy. Do you <laughs> know what I mean? But the only needy people that's helping is a fucking bishop sitting in a sauna just you know, just steaming his balls. <laughs> and then I have to feel bad because I don't want to put anything in the basket. You, know? you, you just gave us all reason not to feel bad, especially with that story. No, First of but all. I but I do it anyway because I don't need that that look. You know, of you course, need that look he... from like you know your aunt was looking at you know, see that's what you're gonna do. <laughs> judging, looking, judging, Man. looking. Yeah, yeah. See, see but here's yeah. the thing, right? You're that's so that's why you're... now, bro, the one dollar bills in the states, I fold them up, pow. I put and something. It's all green. It's all the same color. Nobody knows nothing, bro. But that's the thing. We get yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we get screwed because we have the loony here, first of all, and yeah. um, and as well, our money is different colors. So right there, you can't do like in the states. So we get screwed yeah. on all angles, right? You can't, you can't win. Yeah, because you, you you fold the bill. Where's my wallet? <laughs> but anyway, you you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, you fold course. the bill and then you you hide. Let's say like this is the like let's say this is the bill. You know, mm -hmm. you can hide most of it. You can just have. Just like the tip of the bill yeah. showing, just like this much green, absolutely. You can show, and all they see is just a little bit of green. You put it in and you shove it in there so they can't see that the bill's on top. Oh, it was just the one you jam it in there, like I don't know. He shoved his whole hand in there. I don't know what it is, you know. Car, so, I, I know I dropped the 20, bro. Me, I believe it. you know, <laughs> I support the church, bro. I put a 20. What did you do? Put a dollar. That's sad. You know, a bishop living in a yeah, yeah. eight hundred thousand dollar house in Dubai. Yeah, no, the guys live. Listen, that house today, you know, is guaranteed. Like, you know, if not two million, definitely like one point five million how dollar house. You know, what for I mean? sure. And a bishop, one, one, you know, uh, whatever. He's a bishop, but he's then he's a priest. One high level priest, one house, and you know. Probably a few strippers. I don't know. You know what I mean? And I well, these guys are. Am I gonna? Say, yeah, I'm not gonna say it. I don't think I'm gonna say it. A few young kids. Um, but <clears throat> what I was gonna but, say, you know, what what I was gonna say is, oh, so he's basically living exactly like Jesus lived back then, right? He's roughly yeah, yeah. It. that guy's living better than Jesus, bro. Jesus didn't even have that, bro. Jesus drank out of a wooden cup. This yeah, guy living in a million dollar house. And, and he got crucified for it on top of that. Yeah, yeah, I know, bro. Jesus to sleep in a fucking barn. This guy is in a sauna. Nah, I'm <laughs> doing the Lord's work. Yeah. You, you know, it's like they take a... When you become a priest, not that I know everything about priests, but when you take a priest, I know this one thing from Catholic school and mm -hmm. when, you know, teachers are telling us about priests and all that shit. You know, they take a vow, not only of celibacy and all that, but also a vow of poverty. Okay, exactly. You know, as far as the way the church was set up, when you go in, all the little shekels and whatever that we throw into the basket, mm -hmm. like, obviously, you know, you feed the church, whatever. If you know, they don't even pay any property tax, first of all. No. They, no. Pay, they pay no tax. Nothing. Nothing. No tax. So all that money they're collecting is straight profit. Yeah. So the only money that should be used is obviously to feed and clothe the priests, you know, bishops, whatever. Put him in a house. I'm not saying they can't live in a house, you know, but if there's a giant house and it has six rooms, there should be like a bishop, a cardinal, a priest, a deacon, you know, uh, fire uh, tuck, whatever, uh, in each of those rooms. Uh, not that there's uh, one house, six rooms, only one bishop. There should be a, a clergy member in each of those rooms. And Bass, you know? I, have an, I have an idea. Then you start Big Brother Church Edition. Right, bro. Huh? Wouldn't That's, that be crazy? Yeah. Wouldn't that be crazy? Could, you could probably sell that to the, the church. You know what I mean? Go, listen, you want to make some real fucking money. Forget <laughs> about the baskets. <laughs> TV, Mas, TV, Mas, Hollywood. Ma, Massimo and I have an idea. So listen to the, Look at the screen. Bishops all, uh, Mike Andrew says, uh, first of all, Mike, thanks for watching. Bishops all get a certain percentage of money from the churches. From the churches. So bishops are basically capos, bro. They're, they're, they're in yeah. their capos collecting, and then at the end, all the bishop collects a little bit from every church, and then those bishops take a chunk, and then they give it to the, to the you know, the you no. know, uh, capi de tutte, capi fucking capi tutte, the pope. And there you go, and they kiss the hand, and then they pull out the envelope. <laughs> hey, it's, uh, you know, Jimmy from the Church of Saints in St. Louis says hello, 
and he gives them a boost. You know what I mean? That's how it like, works. Yeah. What a That's racket. That's crazy. Man. I even know that that bishops get a percentage. What a racket. Of Unbelievable. Each, what a of racket. Each church. So it's exactly uh, like the mob, basically. Exactly like the mob. It, it's exactly yeah, like the no, mob. Yeah, no, it's, yeah. No, that's what bothers me when these, you know, like even the new Pope, and I'm not trying to talk shit about the Pope. I don't really know the guy, but when people say like, no, this one's different, different. He lives in a, a palace made of gold. You know, it's like he cares about the poor people. But if he cares about the poor people, why does he melt down a few golden statues and maybe feed some kids? You know, I understand, okay, they built the Vatican, it's there. You yeah. can't change anything. But I don't know, there's all this room in the Vatican. Why don't you start putting beds in the fucking Vatican, you know, and make people sleep there? You know what I mean? Yeah. Why? And I know there is, and listen, there are priests out there that do, you know, uh, the Lord's work. Sure. I know there's priests out there that are helping out people. You know, they're yes. taking what they have. They try to feed them. You know, they try to help people. You know, they try, if, the, you know, somebody needs a warm bed, they'll give them a warm bed. I'm not saying that there's not priests that do that. But there's a lot that don't do that. You know what I mean? Like, well, yeah. I mean, with with the endless scandals that we we we've we've yeah, witnessed got, over the over the years. But you know what? That 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 just goes with saying. First of all, why do you? I know that this. I think this pope is trying to change things. Why do you have to take a vow of celibacy? What is it? It's just bringing problems to your church. To, yeah. To your but also, you know what somebody told me is that, like back in the day when like the Catholic Church, you know, all started. Priests were back in the day allowed to have a wife and a family. It's only Catholics that are not allowed. Mm -hmm. Every other thing, Protestants, you know, uh, Baptist, like I'm talking about Christianity, you know what yes. I mean? You know, uh, Baptist, Protestant, whatever it is, they're all allowed to have. But also, priests, Catholic priests, you know, like even the Greek Orthodox, they're allowed having a wife. Yes. You know what I mean? Uh, the, the priests. But, but Catholic priests were at one time. Uh, and I always thought it was always like that, but somebody told like at one time they were allowed to have a wife. But the thing is, if they had a wife, then whatever property, let's say the house that they lived in, then will go to the family. So the Catholic okay. Church didn't want all this property to go to the family of that priest, and then they created the whole celibacy thing so they can't marry. Because if they would marry, then once they pass away, that house has to go legally to their children so basically it's all about money that's unbelievable yeah it's all about so they can keep all the property that's unbelievable that's unbelievable so that's here's... Was, like i i said exactly i remember it was like a few years or whatever i said exactly what you just said i'm like i don't understand why don't they just let priests get married and let them have you know uh you know a, a partner a spouse every other you know form of religion you know whatever it is christianity yeah you know muslims uh you know, rabbis are have wives, all this. I go, why can't we? And and my friend was like, oh, that's they used to be allowed, but then the church changed it so the family can never get the property. That, that's so interesting. That's really what it comes down to, bro. They wanted to keep the fucking land. That is so interesting. So here's a great idea. So a lot of people saying hi, by the way. Uh, Dario Vitali. Hello. Ciao, everybody. Chofo in the ring. Uh, Reno Vericchio. Uh, Mike Andrew. Robert S. has a great idea. Massimo should make Massimo. the Godfather 3. Four, he said, bro. You can't uh, read uh, numbers, bro. It's clearly a four. Godfather four, <laughs> and him being the pope, <laughs> you're gonna be the yeah. pope, huh? That'd be nice. <laughs> that would be nice. Uh, but but speaking speaking of act, acting, actually, this is a pretty good uh, segue. Um, yes, man. I've heard I've heard a, a lot of uh, great feedback. First of all, uh, from from your recent uh, acting, uh, sh what we could call a short film, basically. Yeah, it's which short is, film. I, okay, I, I feel like I know what you're about to tell which me. Is, I, which is called a short film. Yeah, Night Shift, right? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, short film. Yeah. So uh, I've heard amazing things. I saw a few clips of it. Could, but by the way, could you tell us where we could see the actual entire? Um, yeah, there's. Um... If you go like just on the YouTube. Okay. And search like I don't like I can't like I, I'm trying to remember where the link was, but if you go on, like on YouTube and search Night okay. Shift, um, you know Night Shift Montreal, it'll probably come up. Or if you just okay. search Night Shift Massimo, um, but definitely it's online. Okay, so 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 for all of you watching and listening, guys, apparently this is something to really see. I saw a few clips of it, and uh, it's it's amazing. Uh, probably yeah, I really talk. I play a cycle that kills everybody. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> uh, I don't get typecast at all. 
I'm, just, uh, John... I'm always playing degenerates, murderers. <laughs> one time I like to play a nice guy. You know what I mean? Just yeah, one. Just one time. One yeah, time. I'm I like nice you guy. don't. I'm sorry. You don't look. You don't have that face of a nice guy. <laughs> but that's that's hurtful, man. That's hurtful. a very nice person. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm smiling, sure. huh? What, I don't want to hurt nobody. You know what uh, I mean? No, John... I get it. I get it. Sometimes I look at my face. I'm like, fuck. I <laughs> you know, I get it. I get it. I watched it on the plane yesterday. How are you going to watch him? On... Uh, John Fugal. Johnny. Yeah, you yeah, know yeah, John? Yeah, I... yeah, yeah, I went to uh, school with him. Awesome. John, he's, a, he's a little bit uh, younger. He's, like, I think, like a couple years younger. But I went, um, I w went to school with his brother. Well, like when I say I went to school, we're in like the same grade. Yeah. But I also went to school with Johnny just that he was uh like a couple of a couple of grades younger uh than me. Yeah, I know John John's a great guy. He used to be my boss actually. We were still good. Oh friends. yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, John's a good guy. Um so so here here's the thing. So tell us about night shift and the the feedback that, that's been received uh through critics and all this, because I heard it, it did a little bit of a buzz. Can you tell us a little <laughs> bit what, what is it? How did it come about? Uh, well, there, this guy, um, Anthony uh, Calabrese, he, uh, he wrote it. Okay. And uh, I did a play with him. Um, he wrote this other, this play, I forget what it was called. But uh, I did a play with him like years ago. And then he, he was working on this other short film that he wrote. And then he wrote this short film. And he wanted me to be in it. And, you know, we're talking about it for a while because there was the other things that he was working on. And uh, anyway, long story short, he asked me to do it, and, and okay. I, I did it. And, you know, it, it did really well, you know what I mean, as far as uh, the, the festivals that it was submitted to. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I won Best Actor of the, the festival, you know. But, uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. It was, uh, you know, <laughs> Absolutely it was deserves nice. an applause. Nice. I'm still poor. I'm still poor. <laughs> and, um, but, yeah, so it won, yeah, but I, I won, like, uh, Best Actor of the festival, it also won, uh, I think, in another festival or maybe the same festival, you know, best cast and oh, nice. And there was a couple other. There was definitely also like a few other nominations. Okay. Uh, but definitely, I know it won best cast in one festival, and I won best actor either in that same festival or another festival. And then I think there might have been another award won. I forget for what, but there was also another two or three other nominations for other things. I think nominations for writing and. All that, so you know, it's a short film, but you know, as far as as a short film goes, it, it did it did well as far as critics. There was also uh, some nice write ups in um, in a newspaper. I think the Laval the Laval News mm -hmm. wrote a nice article. The Suburban as well yep. uh, wrote a nice article. And there was a couple other articles that were written, but it was all you know as far as um, whatever was said or written about it mm -hmm. uh, was all you know good good feedback. You know, which was That's it's always cool. That's awesome. So, I mean, for people that don't that uh, that are watching that don't know you um, or what you've me, done, I'm the best if you've ever seen me. No, you are. That's why I fucking love you. Uh, uh, I'm not that good. Uh, uh, no, what were you saying? That's not true. Uh, so, so I know that you know you you were originally well. You you started off as a comedian, right? And then you went into acting. Is that is that do, do I have yeah, a right? Like or? basically, like I I started doing stand up. I was like 23 years old. I started. In the year 2000, but when I was like, like 21, you know, maybe a couple of years before I started doing stand up, um, you know, I was interested in, you know, getting into acting, um, but you know, I didn't have any, you know, real experience and all that. So I started as far as thinking about acting, and there was like, you know, remember back in the day there used to be these uh, two free newspapers called the the Mirror and the Hour. Yes. Right, and in those papers, because I met, there's been as bars to go to, and there was this guy. Who, um, well, he's still an actor now, but you know, at the time he was an actor, and it was basically the first person I ever met that was, you know, an actor going to auditions. Okay. And then I said, "How do you get started if you have no experience?" He goes, "Well, you know, wait till you have to build a, you know, like a demo reel, like you know, so you can show an agent, you know, mm -hmm. roles that you've done." And then he told me about, he goes, "You know, sometimes you can find these student films like Concordia and all that. They're doing mm -hmm. a student film, being actors, you can find it." So you know, I was kind of looking through there and going to auditions. And uh, anyway, long story short, I never really did anything as far as when I decided to start, you know, when I was 21. And then, yeah, when I was 23, you know, I started doing stand-up. And, um, you know, I, I remember finding, like, an agent when I was, like, 25 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it didn't really work out. And I just said, you know, and I was getting, 
you know, better and better in stand-up comedy and, you know, starting to do, you know, more weekend spots, uh, you know, at the clubs and all that. Mm -hmm. And then I just kind of just, you know, just concentrated fully just on stand-up. Didn't really think too much uh, about acting because, you know, I definitely wanted to act and I definitely wanted to go and audition for roles. But a lot of agents that I spoke to, like any agent worth having, mm -hmm. um, lots of time they're like, are you part of the union? And I'm like, no. They're like, yeah. ah, I only like representing people that are already part of the union or at least an apprentice in the acting union. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, not that it turned me off. I was just like, I just kind of not really discouraged, but for lack of a better word, kind of discouraged. But I was at the end of the day, I'd be like, well, you know, uh, yeah, you know, above everything, you know, I love doing stand up the most. So I'm like, yeah. well, you know, I got stand up. I'm doing all of that. You know, I'm doing gigs. I'm getting paid to do shows. This is great. And then also, uh, I met this guy, Eric Amber from uh, Calgary and his father's originally from Montreal. Then they moved to Calgary and he had his father own this building and in the bottom, uh, it was this uh, pizzeria. And then on top, mm -hmm. there was like a fire or something. It was kind of burnt out. Anyway, he went there and he renovated it. And then when the lease was up uh, of the pizzeria, he's like, okay, fuck off. <laughs> and he didn't renew the lease. And then that, he gutted it all out and that became... I don't know if you're familiar with Theater St. Catherine, but that became Theater St. Catherine. And Eric Amber studied in um, uh, in Calgary at this improv theater called Loose Moose, which is you know very well known. Uh, okay. Keith Johnstone, which is a guy who who basically created um, improv. Uh, what is it like improv sports? Like this, like this, you know, like certain games. Um, okay. He also invented like Maestro. Anyway. So he was, you know, he come from like an improv background and he wanted to start an improv school and theater, you know, in Montreal. So um, through him, you know, because I met him at the, the Comedy Zone, which was a comedy club that was over back then. Mm -hmm. I met him through there and we were, we were talking. He's like, yeah, he goes, I want to, you know, make like a little theater and do like improv on Sunday. And then, you know, whatever, whatever shows people want to rent out the theater and do a play, you know, whatever it is. And uh, anyway, long story short, I started doing improv, learning improv there at Theater St. Catherine. So, like, I was doing stand up, and then through the improv, even though it's improvised, you know, I'm still doing scenes with people. Yeah. So, it was fulfilling the acting, you know, uh, bug in me to do it. Um, and also, it was also kind of like my acting school because I was doing scenes with people. You know, obviously, we were doing, you know, uh, comedic improv, comedy improv. Uh, but still, it was acting in scenes of people, listening to people, reacting exactly. to people's reactions, and all that. And then, you know, um, and then basically I got to, really, I started acting when I was like, you know, probably like 12, 13 years into comedy. When I was like about, I think, 34, they were looking, the, you know, I finally got a credit, then I got an agent. And then like 34 years old, it's probably like that, 34, 35 years old. Uh, I started, you know, finally going to auditions and then maybe, I don't know, like, you know, I was going to auditions, not getting roles, getting callbacks yeah. and not getting it. And about like a year into audition, I booked my first role and then just things, you know, kept on rolling from there. Rolling. Yeah. It, it's, it's not, it's not an easy uh, career path to say the least, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. it, 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 well, it, it definitely, it is, it isn't, I would definitely will say yes, 100%. It's not easy, but like once you get into it, like if you're good at it, I'm not trying to like brag or anything, uh, but I've seen it with even a lot of my friends who are very talented or really good actors mm -hmm. or very funny comedians, whatever it is that they do. Um, you know, if you're good at it, you know, you're, you, you know, you, you put your, you know, you put your head into it. You, you really, you know, put all of your focus into it and you work hard. It does become easier with time. You know what I mean? Like when I started yeah. acting, it was very difficult to book a role, but once you start booking roles and then you have, you know, experience, you have things in your resume, you go in for an audition, people like you for a role, they see that you've done other things. It becomes easier with time. It's just a very difficult thing because you get into it and you have to, you know, to get it, you have to learn. You know what I mean? It's not like, yeah. you know, if you want to become a carpenter, you know, it takes you many years and it's very difficult to be a carpenter. But the difference with becoming a carpenter is you start working in a construction company or whatever, and then you start as an apprentice and, but you're working every week. You're working. You're yeah. earning a salary, even though you might not be doing, you know, something too crazy as a carpenter. You're maybe doing, you know, 
uh, more of the grunt work or whatever, and you're slowly working your way up to like master carpenter, and then you know you're doing bigger things and bigger projects. But the only difference is as you're working your way up to master carpenter, you're still collecting a paycheck. Every exactly. Week. Yeah, Whereas a that's... comedian, you know, you're starting out open mic nights. There's no money, and you know, some people, you know, after two three years of doing stand up, doing open mic nights, all, like I remember one, you know, comic. He was like doing comedy three years, and you know, all he was doing, you know, after three years, he was basically making a living out of comedy. And then there's comedians that take them, you know, seven or eight years before. Wow. There's comedians that do comedy, never end up never. making, yeah. you know, a living. You know, I probably was like, you know, maybe, I don't know, 10 years in before I really started, you know, like definitely after like three or four years, I was definitely making, you know, money, you know, a chunk of cash, but mm -hmm. not enough to support, you know, uh, you know, to support me and all that. But 10 years into it about, you know, I started earning you know, and getting more gigs. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, I don't, you know, slowly, slowly you start working less at the place. Then you're like, yeah. well, I got all these gigs coming up. I don't have time. You tell your boss, listen, I can't be here for the next two months. I want to be traveling, doing shows. Yeah. And all of a sudden you find yourself not working a nine to five job and you're just a comedian. And then once you get into that, once you become a working comic, it is mm -hmm. difficult because you never really truly know where your next pick check is coming. But once you start booking gigs, you know, people start calling you back, you know, you go to a club, you know, there might be a one club in Ottawa and you'll go back twice a year. Then a yeah. club in Toronto, you go back, you know, and other cities and other places, you know, one nighters, corporate gigs, and it just keeps on rolling. You never know. You're like, it could just stop any day now, but L like once now. you get the experience, it keeps rolling. Yeah. Like now well, is a, you know, uh, yeah. you know, a very different thing. Like just everything fucking closed. You know I what know. I mean? Uh, it's you know I I, th I think you guys are honestly essential workers to make us laugh and to, to give us our sanity back. I agree, but bro. I I really do, and and especially me, I I love live shows, whether it be theater, right. music, comedy. Um, yeah, so, it's been very difficult. I haven't performed yeah. comedy in like you know, because uh, just as I was leaving Montreal is when they you know opened everything up, so I left Montreal, and then I came here, and you know. Um, you know, I'm new to here, so I got to break into. And then I started getting a little paranoid, and now I'm kind of like ready to get back into the scene. But it's like, it's been like you know, uh, since you know March of last year, it's like you know, going on what is it like eight, nine months that I haven't performed live on a stage. You know what I mean? Like it's it's crazy. It, it really is. But but on that on that note, you you mentioned something before in terms of resume. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Massimo amongst other movies was on X Men. And um, mm -hmm. huge blockbuster, obviously everyone knows that. Tell me, how did that come about? I mean, I mean, and 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 also, like, was was that pretty much the, if I could say, the highlight of your acting career? Or yeah, definitely, uh, uh, definitely a very very big uh, moment, and definitely a highlight of, of my acting career. It was also the second thing that I ever booked. What? Like that? Wow. That was, okay. Yeah. Like I, I, the first thing I booked. Um, was uh, this uh, show that was on uh, Spike TV? Mm -hmm. it was called the Blue Mountain State. I think it's on Netflix now. Okay. They show uh, there's I think three or four seasons, but it was Blue Mountain State. They were um, there was like uh, some scene where there's like this porn shoot. It's it's about the, like a f uh, college football team, right? Okay. So anyway, it's like this porn shoot, and then there was an audition. Um, for a Ron Jeremy type looking person, <laughs> and at the time I had uh, like a porn stash, like a Ron Jeremy, you know, like a handlebar <laughs> mustache, and then I had the, you know the little pinch over here, and then just the handlebars. And it was you know because I I've grown like beards and the, you know mustache goatees, and then I after a while I get fed up and I shave them off. And yeah. I was like lying on the couch watching TV, and I was feeling it because you know when you have fucking hair, you yeah, try yeah, to eat yeah. fucking food, it's always getting stuck in there. <laughs> and I was feeling my mustache. I go, I think I'm gonna fucking shave this off. And then my agent at the time sent me a text, and she's like, I have an audition for you. Uh, they're looking for a uh, Ron Jeremy looking uh, type it's for <laughs> this you know scene where there's a porn shoot. And I was like, ah, maybe I'll leave the mustache on <laughs> yeah, for, sure. for an extra day. And uh, so anyway, that was the first thing I shot. I played a porn star. And then um, the, the next thing after that, that I ended up booking is a fucking yeah, X-Men blockbuster film. Unbelievable. And, yeah. And I think the first three things that I might have booked, 
uh, were American productions, you know, and okay. American, there's definitely, you know, Canadian productions that have, you know, that, you know, that there is money involved, but, you know, mm -hmm. usually compared to the two, you know, Canadian productions yeah. don't have as much as American uh, productions. So like you do a lot of like hours, you do like, like, you know, X-Men, it was like, I think the first day I did like 15 hours and then the, the second day was like 14 hours. And, you know, once you start, like you have to pay you for like eight hours minimum. And then after eight hours, it's like time and a half. And then after 10 hours, it's like double time. So, you know, you, the more hours you make in a day, you start making overtime. Sure. And, you know, it comes out, you know, you get, you know, paid a lot. So anyway, the first three things I did were just like, you know, it's big production. So they just keep you there. They get you there early. They make you leave really late. And then, you know, when I started doing like the first kind of Canadian thing I did, they're like, all right, it's cool. I'm like, guys, what do you thought? There's, you know, we've only been here for seven hours. Uh, usually, isn't it like you leave after, leave after like 15, 16 hours. I got you. Yeah, I'm, I'm you expecting go. a very large check coming my way, you know? Um, but it was like, the, you know, it was pretty crazy. Like I was, you know, at that point, like I was auditioning, you know, like I said, I started, you know, as far as actually acting, like, you know, actually going for roles, like having an agent going for actual auditions, not just like going to these like student film auditions. I was like 34. I was auditioning, you know, uh, when I booked about Mountain State, maybe, I don't know, six to eight months, could have been even a year, who knows. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I basically had been in the game, you know, auditioning for maybe a year. You know, I finally booked this one thing, a TV show. I'm like, this is amazing. You know, and then I go audition, you know, I audition for a couple other things, don't get it. Then I finally land another thing. All of a sudden, I'm in fucking X Men. This huge, you know, yeah. I think it was a two hundred million dollar budget, budget. You know, and I'm I'm going in. They're like, okay, you need to come in to do, you know, uh, with the stunt team to practice the stunts. And I'm like, holy shit, I'm like a real actor. And then I go in and rehearse with the stunt team, you know. And then there's the you know Hugh Jackman stunt double, right? And um, so we're going through the, you know, the, what are the fight scene, what I have to do. And then a couple of days later, they're like, uh, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, cause I think somebody didn't end up sending me the message. I'm like, you know, you're supposed to be here right now. What's going on? I go, what are you talking about? I go, no one ever sent me you know, a message. They're like, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, you need to be here now because we have to rehearse the, the fight scene with Hugh. I'm like, Hugh, Hugh, and then I show up, you know, and I knew I was going to be like on set, let's say like on Tuesday, but they had me come in like the Thursday before. So like I wasn't prepared to like meet Hugh Jackman that day. So it's just kind of, and then I get there and he's like, hey, how you doing, Mike? You know what I mean? And he's like, <laughs> right? And super, super nice guy. Yeah, how was that? I'm just standing there and, you know, I'm practicing this fucking, fun, you know, stunt fucking scene with him slashing me with the claws, you know, whatever. Um, and, you know, and just crazy experience, you know, super nice guy, you know. Um, I, but I yeah, highlight of my life to just, when I landed the role and I knew, because, you know, they changed the things a little bit because, you know, there was like uh, the movie, like before that came out, there was uh, Wolverine Origins story and a lot of things got leaked and all that. And it kind of ruined, you know, that movie as far as the money it could have yeah. made because a lot of things, like the actual movie even got leaked at one point wow. or many scenes. But anyway, long story short, um, when I auditioned, it didn't say like Wolverine. But then like I'm, you know, reading it and I know this guy's going back in time. And I go, if there's anybody who was going to go back in time, you know, or whatever, and look exactly the way he looked in, you know, uh, 1967 as he looks in, like, 2050, yeah. it's going to be Wolverine because he rejuvenates and all that shit. Yeah. So I knew it was that. And then when I booked a role and I knew, I'm like, holy shit, I'm going to be in X-Men and Wolverine is going to stab me in the chest. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, it was like such a, it still is, you know, like right now just talk about it and think about it. Such a you know surreal moment, you know what I mean? I because can imagine you're, you're hitting him, and you're probably thinking, "Holy shit, man! I'm 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 hitting Hugh Jackman." I'm yeah, well, I didn't really get to hit him. I I, I fired oh, yeah. a gun, and then he like popped bullets out of his chest, and then just gave us all like beatings. There was not even like one punch or whatever I threw. Yeah. But yeah, so no, just to be, you know, and then also just the scene, you know, um, when I moved to Toronto and I was looking for an agent there. You know, I basically got like a really good agent in Toronto just based on that scene. Like I just went, 
I went to like four or five agencies and just left my demo. Just that. And the only thing that was on my demo was just that scene. Incredible. It's the only thing I had there. Incredible. I just had that scene. And that basically got me like, you know, one of like the top agents in Toronto. Okay. Just based the fact that she looked at it like, oh, this guy's great. And then, you know. Unbelievable. And then, you know, from there, you know, I lived in Toronto for five years. You know, definitely. Yeah, I, I remember booked, you, you know, were in Toronto. Of, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I booked a bunch of roles, you know, there. And, you know, it's. You know, it's like I said, it's always difficult, and there's times where I go through a little bit of time where I might not be auditioning as much as I might want to, and you know, because I'm not auditioning as much, I'm not booking as many roles. Um, but you know, there's definitely times where a little bit, you know, more lean and whatever. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I feel very, very, you know, fortunate. Like you know, um, yeah, you know, definitely. Like I've been doing, you know, I started doing stand up as far as the you know first open mic mm -hmm. night that I started was like about you know i started 2000 so now it's 21 so like 21, 21 years 21 years ago and um you know and for the past like definitely past you know 10 12 years but definitely you know a good solid 10 years you know i've only i've been making a living and living off you know of just stand up and acting you know yeah. and you know obviously you know i'm not fucking floating in money but you know uh i probably you know but i don't have to i don't have like a nine to five job I don't, you know like i'm just doing you know what i love you know even when i started yeah. doing it people you know my parents and even other people are like i oh, sure i'll do that that's hard man yeah. you're probably gonna starve most of your life and you know it was difficult but i've always i remember when i was a kid i think i was like 14 15 and i remember somebody saying you know if you do what you love eventually the money follows you know and that's just something that stuck with me i was like young yeah. i was just a fucking kid you know yeah i was like 14 15 and it just i heard that and just stuck in my head like yeah no i have to do something that i love and yeah that that makes like just made sense to me it's like yeah you Absolutely. do what you love eventually the money follows and i did and there was time you know listen there's, there's been times even even so, some know, dark recently days, sure. where i think to myself fuck is it really worth it just this yeah. fucking struggle never knowing where my next paycheck yeah. is coming and every once in a while you see something like remember like Jim Carrey talking about it, like his dad who had a great job. I think his dad was like an accountant or whatever. Yes, I saw that. He had yeah. a great job and all of this. And then one day the company closed or they downsized. He lost his job. And like Jim Carrey and his family were living basically on the street. Like they, mm -hmm. they lived in a fucking van or something for some time. And then he thought to himself, you know, if you know, if, you know, I'm not wording it properly, but basically, yeah. he said, you know, to, something to the effect of like, if my father lost his job and lost everything, and he was doing something that's considered, you know, a safe bet, I might as well just do something, do whatever, to, you know, do what I love, yeah. because even the things that people look at as a secure, you know, job, a secure thing, can be taken away. So you Absolutely. might as well just fucking do the thing that you love, at least you know. You know, you know I, I'm kind of rambling and not saying no, no, and you're, and you're, as, as no. beautifully as Jim Carrey said it. But that's what I'm saying. It's like I find it difficult, but in my head, I'm like, what am I going to do? Stop doing this, you know? And it's not even because I've met, you know, like when I was in my 20s, met comics who are like my age now. Like mm -hmm. I'm 44, yeah. and when I was like, you know, 25 years old, talking to a comic who's like 44, 45, and you start talking to them, you're like, you know, but you know. You ever see he goes, ah, I'm fucking tired of it. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, well, why do you keep doing it then? He goes, Oh, what exactly. else am I gonna do? You know, I'm 45 or I'm 50. I'm like, there's a ton of things you can do. You do it because you love it. And you know, I always wanted to never ever be that guy who's bitter and like, well, what else am I gonna do at this yeah. point? You know? And if I wanted to stop, there's a ton of things I can do. You know what I mean? I have a passion for cooking. You know, I also used to be like a bartender, you know, mm -hmm. I saw also you know the kind of you know, manage bars. Like I can a hundred percent stop comedy and acting today. Find a little, maybe not right now because of COVID and everything's closed, yeah. but here in Florida, everything's open. So definitely here in Florida, yeah, I, I, but I can find, I can find a little spot, open up a bar and I can probably run the best bar or even, you know, I like working my hands. I like, you know, carpentry, building things. I can become a carpenter, work for myself, you know whatever building decks or whatever or yeah, renovating absolutely. people's you know basement there's so many things i can do that's why it always bothered me when i spoke to older comics when i was younger they're like well what else am i supposed to do like i'm 50 it's the only thing i know to do and i'm like do you if you don't want you do it because you love it and you don't want to admit 
that you love it because you want to play the whole fucking the bitter victim. comic. Yeah. yeah, not even victim, just that because there's this thing in stand up comedy where people think that we have, you know, we have to play this whole like, you know, dark angel. It's like, yeah, yeah I'm funny, but it comes with a price. You know, they got to yeah. play this whole fucking character. Yeah. And it's like, dude, it's okay to be fucking happy and enjoy your fucking life and be a comedian. Everybody thinks like, you know, comedy comes from a dark place. It's like, no, you're funny. Like, that doesn't come from a dark place. You're born funny. And then but, because you're born funny, you go through a dark time. And because you're a funny individual, you can see the funny. As the you funny, rise out of funny, it, the, you know? Yeah. You know yeah I mean? Because, because I, anytime... I've, I'm sorry. No, no. I, just, I wanted to just say because I, I've seen a lot of times that I... I, I I hear like I, I watch other podcasts or other shows and a lot right. of comedians and I've had a lot of comedians on and, and it's right. funny that you say that because a lot of comedians say, uh, you know, that or comedians think that a lot in general, a lot of comedians yeah. uh, are, are depressed or come or, or have inadequacies. Yeah, they do. But that's because they they're fucking human. You know what I mean? We're not, yeah. we're not any different. We're just people who are funny and have like, there's people who are born, with a natural, uh, uh, you know, um, ability to be great with numbers. You know, there's yes. children who are 10 years old and are just born with this ability for numbers. And at 10 years old, they can solve, you know, mathematical equations and problems uh, faster and better than a fucking adult three times their age. Like Absolutely. a 10 year old can destroy a 30 year old who knows about, who understands mathematics, but this kid's so, like when I was like 10 years old, I used to stand in class, and that's why I say it's just something I was born with. I yeah. remember being five years old, you know, making, cracking up people, cracking up other kids, making them laugh. There was nothing fucked up in my life at that point, at five, you know what I mean? But I remember being like 10, 12 years old, a 10-year-old, standing in front of a, a teacher who's like 30, 35, 40, 50 years old, and they're saying shit, and I'm saying things back to them. And they're trying to get out just like, you know, trying to have the last word. But I'm always having the last word. And I'm freaking them out. And a kid of 10 is driving this adult crazy. Every answer they have, everything they're trying to, you know, shut me down, shut me up, you know, to, to just quiet yeah. me. They can't say anything because everything they say, I have an answer for it back. And my answer is better that like my burn is better than their burn. And there's a 10 year old child burning this fucking just roasting, roasting a fucking 40 year old adult, a 10 year old child. And all the other children are laughing with every fucking burn, every roast. And the teacher comes back, tries to roast me and put me in my place as they're usually used to doing to a 10 year old child. Of course. But I'm coming back with a bigger burn. You know what I mean? So to say that comedy comes from a dark place, it doesn't. You're born with it. But because I'm born with humor, I'm born with this ability to see the funny side of everything. Mm -hmm. When I go through something dark in my life, I can rise out of it and write something. And I've never, ever written anything funny when I'm in a bad place in my life. When I'm in a bad place in my life, I can't write anything funny. It's when I rise out of that darkness, I can turn back and go, fuck, that was fucked up. And I'm glad I'm out of it. And now that I'm out of it, I can see the funny side. You can see the light, you know? yeah. You yeah, know, it, and it's, it's, that's that's it, it's, you know that's the thing that people don't understand. And and yeah, there is a lot of comics that are depressed. And I know a lot of comics that are depressed. I know a lot of comics are actually just well-adjusted people. But that's the thing yeah. is we're all people. So the same thing. If I go to a comedy club and there's ten comics, yeah, there's gonna be some people that are depressed and whatever. Some people that are well, you know. Uh, totally fine and well-adjusted, but I can also go to an accounting firm. Same thing. Talk to Absolutely. 10 accountants and I'll find three or four accountants that are like manic depressive or whatever, or have depression and all that. At the end of the day, comedians are just normal, regular people that know how to be funny. So we're going to have normal, regular problems like everybody else. I know yeah. comics who came from the fucking slums and their parents were dirt fucking poor and had nothing. Do you know what I mean? And I know fucking mm -hmm. comics who their parents are fucking loaded and they had everything they fucking ever wanted in their life. You know what I mean? People come from all different walks of life. Walks of life. You know what I mean? I, I, I find it amazing that it, your talent manifested itself so young because they always say that, right? You could see sometimes the yeah. talent when it comes to, to that, that you were able to do that at such a young age. And it was a great analogy that you put up with the kids, uh, you know, of, of seeing a talent, a, a 10 year old, 
and I, you know, I see it in my son. My son's 11. In the math, I look yeah. at him. Like, how did you get 98 at this exam? I goes, oh, yeah. daddy, uh, sorry, I didn't get 100. And what do you mean you didn't get a? Yeah, what are you exactly, yeah. I can't yeah, read this so, exam. Yeah, but it's so easy. Like I was, you know, I was actually pretty. Like, talking about math, I was like really good at math when it came to like algebra. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Where every, every other kid was confused. For me, it just made sense because for me, it was just like, oh yeah, you just it's basically a puzzle. You got to figure yeah. out what you know fucking this is. You don't have the value, but you have these other values. Yeah. So you just figure out these values. And then you'll get that value here. It's pretty simple. For me, it was simple because I just saw it and I just saw, you know, you can see it, you know. Mm -hmm. Some people can't see it and they can't excel in that thing, you know. Like, uh, I love music, you know what I mean? Uh, but, I, you know, I, I can't play an instrument. I can't find the Same music. Here. But there's people out there that when they were five years old and they started playing piano, they just found the music. They knew, they just heard it in their head and they just found it. They just sat in front of a piano and all of a sudden it just came to them easily. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like just, yes. public, I've always been like a shy kid and all that, but public speaking's never frightened me because public speaking, I don't need to carry a conversation. True. I just need to carry a um, monologue. I just need to your, carry your monologue, a yeah. speech. I just need to carry a thing to say. I pick a topic, I talk about a topic and I give my opinion of this topic. I don't need to interact with people. I don't need to go, what do you think about that? And then I have to do something on what they think. No, I just go up and I'm like, what's the deal, you know, with yeah, airport bars, which is super hacky material. But you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I just pick a topic and then I just go off and I talk yeah. forever because I'm performing. I'm the performer. I'm standing in front of an audience and all the audience has to do is listen to me. And I all I have to do is just talk say what's in my mind. And yeah. for me, that's an easy thing. It's like, well, why would it be difficult to speak in front of a crowd? Like, you have an opinion on something? Just talk about an opinion. Why people go like, what do you suggest? I want to get into comedy. Like, how do you do it? I go, just think of something you think is funny and then go up on stage and talk about that thing. <laughs> my thing says 10%. So okay. I might, you know, I don't know if you want to talk until it dies or whatever, but no, no, I, no. I have... We there's like uh, 10 minutes left of battery. That's here, good. So. That's good. I, I wanted to, I w first of all, I wanted to uh, just share some, some, some comments. Uh, Mike Keep Andrew up the good work. The Thanks, good work. Mike Andrew. Uh, a, a mutual friend of ours, Lena Lessie says, Hey, Mass, for oh, as long that's as. That's not a mutual friend of ours, bro. That's my cousin, bro. Yes. <laughs> and I've known Lena since we were kids. We went to elementary and high school together. She says, Hey, Mass, for as long as I can remember, you stayed up many nights, staying up late watching Jay Leno at our grandparents' house. You've come so far since then. Amazing accomplishments. Thank you, Koji. Beautiful. I, I, really, I really appreciate that. Thank you, Lana. Um, Dario Vitali is a loyal watch, a watcher and listener of our show. Ron, Ron Jeremy, Jeremy. Laughing, laughing my ass off. <laughs> um, Reno wants to know uh, what's your next movie. Uh, I don't know if you can answer that yet. Well, if you have it, uh, actually, I, I, uh, I just you know because you know I was I'm working on like anyway. Uh, I'm actually like I'm in Florida, but I will be returning back to Montreal. Mm -hmm in uh, a couple of days and uh i was in the first season of uh, the moody's starring uh, dennis leary okay and yes. uh, elizabeth perkins and uh, jay baruchel also mm -hmm. from montreal, from montreal yeah. yeah and they did the first season also mike patterson uh, yes montreal comic montreal he's also comic. in it as well anyway um so they're returning to do a second season first season was obviously done in montreal they're returning so i'm returning to do uh, 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 recurring role that I had. I'm l l losing uh, speech over here, but yeah, I'm going back. I, pl I play a character in the first season called uh, D Dimitris uh, Dukakis, playing <laughs> a Greek dude, and we, uh, I'm, uh, you know, we own a uh, like heating and AC company yeah. called the Dukakis Brothers, and uh, yeah, so I'm I'm actually going back. Go back to that, okay. And also, I have on. Uh, I think I already started the first season. I mean, the third season, but I'm also um, in the third season of American Gods on Stars. Okay. And I think January 23rd on Lifetime starts uh, a mini series about um, the uh, 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 Salt and Pepper, right? Remember the, the two hip hop duo from back in the 80s? Salt okay. and Pepper. You're, you're old enough to remember Salt and Pepper. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. We're same uh, age. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so there's that mini series, Salt and Pepper, coming out, and I have uh, a small role in that. And, a lot of uh, stuff American coming Gods, up. And then, uh, you know, uh, whatchamacallit, The Moody's, it's called. First one was about uh, 
it was uh, Moody's Christmas. But okay. every season, there's something different happening. You know what I mean? I want to give away too much because I can't really right. say too much about what's happening. But the first season was a Moody's Christmas. And then basically, instead of doing like a series that's just about a family, basically, the, um, the show is like every season is basically something else happening. It could be like, okay. you know, one year, one season, it's Christmas. Maybe the, you know, the next season, it's about, you know, whatever, uh, Valentine's or whatever the fuck. You know what I mean? So uh, I'm gonna put that in the show notes. All your uh, so where's the best place where uh, people could see your um, your social media? My handle? things, yeah. Just, things. You know, if yeah, if you go to like Instagram um, uh, at Massimo Comedian, so Instagram okay. at Massimo Comedian, and then uh, in my bio there's a link, and it's, it gives all the links to everything else: TikTok, Facebook, awesome, YouTube, all them things. Ray Alfano says it was an honor to get smashed in the head with a hammer by you in night shift. Nice, bro. Me, <laughs> it was an honor to smash your head with a hammer. And uh, Pat uh, Pat IGG says, Massimo, did you bring Ziggy to Florida? I don't know. No, what uh, you know, because when, when I came, you know, it was during COVID, so I wasn't mm -hmm. sure if they were going to let me on the plane with the dog. But okay. I'm going back to Montreal. Not only I'm going to be in the Moody's, but it's also Operation Ziggenstein, save the dog. So I'm going to go back. <laughs> And then when I come back here to the U.S., awesome. uh, I'll grab uh, Ziggy. And then, bro, me and Ziggy are just going to take over Clearwater, bro. Awesome. You know what I mean? Listen, I'm the brains. He's the brawn. There you, know you go. I mean? Let's yeah. wrap it up. I want to say thank before your phone dies. I want to say thank you so much. I want to say thank a huge you. congratulations to you. Uh, Montreal uh, boy making it in, in, in Hollywood, if I could say, and doing what he loves. Not really, but, you know, uh, Montreal Press boy. Uh, you know, uh, doing things you for, know us, I mean? you doing stuff. for us, you are for us, you yeah, are, thank you. you're, you're our star. So, uh, listen, I, I want to say thank you. Uh, I, you could be you, honestly, you are an inspiration. You do what you're doing, what thank you, you love, you're doing what you love, and uh, keep making us laugh, man. Keep making us laugh with those, with those uh, skits and and just oh uh, man, just the skits that you've done with all the other Montreal, uh, some much other Montreal in the Toronto. I wanted to play it, but I didn't have enough time, but that's okay with it. I had Paul, it's all good. Uh, Paul Laduca, uh, another actor from Toronto uh, that you did. Few yes, skits. Paul. Yeah, good friend yeah. of mine. Yeah, yeah. Paul uh, was on my podcast a few uh, a few weeks ago. Oh, so, nice. Uh, yeah, yeah, a great guy as well. So, thank you so much again, Massimo. It was it was great. Stay on. We could have a quick chat after, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll uh, see you next week. Have a great the rest of the week and a great weekend, guys. A big storm's coming our oh, way. Oh, fuck! Nice. Yeah, no, no, yeah. yeah, Just no in time for the storm. I fucking hate you, man. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thanks again, Massimo. Thank you, buddy.